You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Last time we checked in with the Artemis Accords, we had Germany signing on in September as the 29th signatory of the agreement on best practices for space. So congratulations today to the Netherlands for becoming the 31st signatory of the Artemis Accords. Yeah, I know. Did I miss something? Did we all miss something? No, it's not just you. T-minus. Today is November 2nd, 2023. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T Minus. The Netherlands and Iceland join the Artemis Accords. Kuva Space raises 16.6 million euro. Intuitive Machines gets a nuclear-powered satellite contract. And T-minus producer Alice Carruth speaks to David Caponio, Senior Vice President of Product and Business Development at VAST. Stay with us. Here's our Intel briefing for today. Yesterday at the Dutch ambassador's residence in Washington, D.C., the Netherlands Space Office Director Harm van de Vettering signed the Netherlands onto the U.S.-led Artemis Accords, making the Netherlands the 31st country to join the agreement. Van de Vettering said this, NASA and the Netherlands have been strong partners in space from the early days of spaceflight. Pushing boundaries by technology brings new responsibilities— By signing the Artemis Accords, we underline the values we share in space, and we acknowledge that we have a common responsibility. And as for Artemis signatory number 30, that was actually Iceland. If you're wondering where that announcement went, well, so are we. (laughs) Apparently, Iceland became an Artemis Accords signatory in October, but there was no ceremony to mark the occasion, and in fact... Iceland joining Artemis wasn't even made public by NASA or Iceland until yesterday's announcement about the Netherlands, where there was one sentence mention of it at the bottom of a press release. I guess they just wanted to be really low-key about it. The European Space Agency has outlined its space safety program plans on how to boost awareness of threats from space to vital infrastructure, both on Earth and in orbit, and how to protect them plus its planned use of artificial intelligence to significantly improve the sustainability, security, and resilience of ESA space missions and operations. Primary space-based threats include space weather, naturally occurring space-borne objects like meteoroids, and artificial space debris. ESA member states have encouraged the agency to adopt a zero-debris approach for its missions and to enable other actors to pursue similar paths. ESA says this will put Europe at the forefront of sustainability on Earth and in space while preserving the competitiveness of its industry. 
The latest Polaris space plane demonstrator Mira has successfully conducted its first flight at a German airfield. According to the company's statement, Mira conducted a perfect first flight without any issues. The vehicle flew for approximately two and a half minutes and covered a distance of nine kilometers. The main objective of Mira was to flight test a linear aerospike rocket engine under contract with the German Armed Forces. The initial flight testing was executed under turbine power, while aerospike flight testing will follow by the end of this year. Mira, being the fifth demonstrator in the Polaris fleet, is also the last demonstrator on the roadmap towards the company's planned space plane. Finnish Earth observation company Kuva Space has successfully raised 16.6 million euro in a latest funding round. The company says it will use the capital to accelerate the development of its patented hyperspectral camera and space technology, double its team size, and launch its AI analytics platform. Kuva Space also plans to expand its presence in key markets, starting with the United States. The company's commercial microsatellite is equipped with a patented hyperspectral camera and can distinguish nearly any material on Earth and its condition through its distinct spectral signature. Kuva says that they can monitor things like crop types, plant health and biomass, biodiversity, soil conditions, seaweed growth, algae blooms, and marine chemical pollutants at scale. Muon Space has been awarded a Hydrosat contract for its first Constellation as a Service spacecraft that will integrate Hydrosat's multispectral and thermal infrared imaging instruments. According to the press release, this partnership marks an advancement of Hydrosat's plans to deploy a constellation of LEO smallsats that provide critical data for improving agricultural water use efficiency in response to increasing scarcity of fresh water due to climate change. Muon Space will equip one of its Constellation as a Service satellites launching in 2024 with Hydrosat's second demonstration commercial imaging payloads. That payload is designed to measure multispectral surface reflectance and land surface temperature. These capabilities will contribute to the efforts of both companies to collect important remote sensing data that targets key climate applications. The U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory Space Vehicles Directorate has awarded Intuitive Machines a joint energy technology supplying on-orbit nuclear power, known as Jetson, low-power mission application contract. The $9.49 million award calls for Intuitive Machines to develop technical solutions for satellite positioning and maneuverability using radioisotope power systems in support of NASA's Gateway, a multi-purpose outpost orbiting the moon. Yup, nukes on a satellite. Pete McGrath, Intuitive Machines Vice President of Business Development, said this of the award. Developing the ability to expand power sources beyond solar, which require heavy battery storage, could remove the burden of constantly worrying about a spacecraft's arrays relative to the sun and potentially deliver long-term stability for satellites that would otherwise lose power over time. Yep, I still love that nuclear-powered satellite bit, too. Virgin Galactic has completed its sixth space flight this year from Spaceport America in New Mexico. The Galactic 05 mission saw the company's spaceship converted into a suborbital space lab for space-based research. The crew included planetary scientist and associate vice president in Southwest Research Institute space sector, Dr. Alan Stern and bioastronautics researcher for the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences, Kelly Girardi. Alan and Kelly conducted human-tended research during the suborbital spaceflight. Alan's mission was also a training flight for a future suborbital spaceflight as part of NASA's Flight Opportunities Program. And Alan used a biomedical harness to collect physiological data related to human spaceflight and conducted practice activities for an astronomical experiment on the NASA flight. As for Kelly, she flew three payloads, two of which evaluated novel healthcare technologies in microgravity conditions. Her payloads collected biometric data with the AstroSkin biomonitoring device and examined how confined fluid behaves to inform future healthcare technologies in space. More details about their missions can be found through the links in our show notes. 
hybrid rocket engine design and manufacturing company Firehawk Aerospace have announced the development of a 30-square-mile launch range in West Texas. The site will serve as a testing range for the company's current and future flight test contracts for the United States government and other partners. Currently, Firehawk manufactures their product at their Dallas headquarters and now performs static fire tests of their hybrid rocket engines at their two-acre test site in Midland, Texas. The new launch range will enable testing of the propulsion system in flight. And continuing on Monday's program theme about India's heyday in space, the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Indian Space Research Organization to develop a joint small satellite. No further details about the small satellite were released with the announcement. That concludes our Intelligence Roundup for today. You'll find links to further reading in our show notes, including an announcement from Rocket Lab welcoming Lieutenant General Nina Armongo to the company's board of directors. They're all at space.n2k.com. Hey, T-Minus crew. If your business is looking to grow your voice in the industry, expand the reach of your thought leadership, or recruit talent, T-Minus can help. We'd like to hear from you. Send us an email at space at n2k.com or send us a note through our website so we can connect about building a program to meet your goals. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Today is the last day of the Beyond Earth Institute's symposium exploring new commercial LEO destinations. One of the leading commercial space stations is Haven 1, which is being developed by VAST. T-minus producer Alice Carruth caught up with VAST Senior Vice President of Product and Business Development, David Caponio. Well, we're a relatively new company, founded just about two years ago, uh, with a vision of creating an artificial gravity space station. Last May, uh, we announced our first space station called Haven 1. Uh, it's a single Falcon 9 module space station to be launched uh, by August 25. Um, and then to be shortly thereafter crewed with a uh, four-person crew from SpaceX Dragon launch, um, and then a total mission lifetime of three years with 40 days of crew time uh, spread out over four missions. Wow. Yeah. So you come in at an angle that other companies aren't doing in that CLD area of mm -hmm. bringing in artificial gravity. Correct. Why are you doing that? What's the benefit of having that artificial gravity environment when others are looking for microgravity for experiments, for example? That's true. Um, we had our first conversations with, with NASA um, on artificial gravity. They were static. Um, this has been a dream for them uh, for the last uh, two or three decades, and since the early part of the ISS, um, to have uh, some sort of artificial gravity generation on a large scale. They do have centrifuges um, on, on board, but this would be you know, full life-size uh, human-rated centrifuge in space uh, with the whole Cyrus space station. And we did this, uh, you know, like I said, it's the vision of the company, the founder, uh, Jed McCaleb, um, who's uh, our single founder and funder uh, of the entire uh, Haven One plan and through the future, um, did this because um, one of the major challenges of humanity living in space is the detrimental effects of microgravity. Um, everything from bone loss to muscle loss, even brain um, effects, um, the octave nerves. I mean, there's just been a whole host of study in microgravity on deleterious effects of, of uh, microgravity. And the only way to solve that is with artificial gravity. Um, so we do that with centripetal force, simply spinning on the spacecraft. It's no simple feat, of course. So 
incremental approach. Um, and with Haven One, even though it's a crewed space station, um, there's uncrewed portions um, that are they're quite lengthy um, where we'll attempt to perform an uncrewed demonstration of artificial gravity. Even at a space station of that size, um, we're able to generate up to one-sixth gravity, which is the gravity found on the moon. Um, we'll have an entire ISS express rack um, that will experience one-sixth gravity for a period of about a week, and basically will become a lunar test bed that you can do in LEO earlier and at a fraction of the cost. So tell me about your customer base. If you're gonna be creating this artificial gravity base in LEO, mm -hmm. Who is it you're looking to attract to get out there? Well, the unique part of um, our next space station, which it's kind of a working title, we're just calling it Stick for now. Um, it would be a Starship class, a seven meter in diameter, uh, seven modules all linked together um, on a hundred meter span. Um, spinning that end over an end like a baton uh, allows you to generate uh, zero G in the center, obviously, and then up to one G at the ends. Um, and then between that, you get uh, variable gravity um, hitting, of course, lunar gravity, Martian gravity, maybe in Venus, um, and then all the way up to eventually one G. Um, so it allows for a gravity laboratory, uh, basically studying the effects of gravity on the human body. We know a lot about one G, we know a lot about zero G, uh, we don't know much about anything in between other than you know two weeks on the moon uh, six times. So it allows us to kind of do that quite easily in LEO. You know, it's still in a you know, zero uh, microgravity environment, testing variable gravities you know, all the way up through, through 1G, and really testing you know, if we do Martian expeditions, you know, six months to get there, 18 months on planet, six months to get back, um, and then you're, you're at a third of gravity while you're on planet. Is, is existing in 1G uh, during the transit enough um, to then you know, exist at, at one third G for another 18 months? Uh, or something maybe a little bit higher, like uh, over 1G, you know, 1.1, 1.2. 1, 1. Um, does that kind of supercharge us to, uh, to then be on planet uh, at, a, at a, a lesser degree, which we have obviously can't be in a centrifuge when we're on planet, um, and then allow us to come back maybe at that accelerated gravity and then be back at Earth at you know, a relatively less affected state. Um, Fantastic. So, yeah. What a great idea. Now, you kind of alluded to it a little bit. You are working with NASA. Can you talk me through that agreement that came out earlier this year? So we were founded uh, just after the uh, selection of commercial LEO destination. So that, is, of course, is a fun in space act agreement with the, the three selectees. Um, and, and we did not propose to that, obviously, because we didn't exist at the time. Uh, but uh, just earlier last, this year, we were selected for the Collaboration and Commercial Space Capabilities, part two, uh, one of seven awardees. And even though that's an unfunded Space Act agreement, um, it does allow us uh, to start the conversation with NASA, um, to develop the relationship, to do initial um, data exchanges um, with a lot of lessons learned from ISS, uh, potential access to uh, NASA testing facilities, um, and, and p potentially NASA services like communications from Tedris. Um, so we're very excited to get going. Um, we had uh, just kick off a few months ago, brought us um, NASA folks down to our shop in uh, Long Beach. We have 115,000 square feet uh, of integration and workspace there um, and kind of showed us our, showed them our plans and, and, and our vision for the future. So. so you're very much a future vision company right. and you've got a roadmap laid out for that. Can you tell us a little bit about that roadmap and what VAST is looking to, look, to do? So we talked a lot about Haven One talked um, a little bit about our future space station, uh, but also on that roadmap is there's another incremental step. As we're a young company, we want to practice in space first. So we have a demonstration mission planned uh, with a small spacecraft, uncrewed, unpressurized, um, we call Haven Demo. They will test a lot of the um, uh, early, you know, initial avionics that we have, kind of the, the, the backbone of our space station, um, some of the uh, low heritage systems, um, get those, you know, space heritage up to QRL9 um, and ready to be incorporated into a crewed spacecraft. Um, and then, uh, you know, incorporating, uh, like I said, the small um, artificial gravity test on a small scale and an uncrewed uh, shorter duration, and then eventually incorporating that into uh, a large space station full time. What a very exciting time for you. You touched on in-space manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you're really pushing for and looking forward to in the, in the future of the aerospace industry as it's starting to really take off right now? So we're kind of looking, you know, as NASA and, and all of the CLD providers is looking for that killer app. Um, what makes sense um, on the manufacturing side to do in microgravity or, or other you know, partial gravities as, as we've talked about? And we, we're really challenging the industries, you know, 
but leading candidates would be pharmaceutical, um, semiconductors, um, but really broaden the area outside of the space industry and how can Earth use microgravity and potentially artificial gravity to do things um, in space and bring them back down to Earth um, to have you know a multiplicative effect um, that you can't do in 1G. Um, so we're excited for that. I think you know with the um, we're, we're now looking towards the end of the International Space Station. It's been an incredible opportunity as a laboratory um, that's been you know, highly subsidized by international space agencies. Um, but now we're looking, we're challenging the industry to really formulate that business plan. Um, what, what makes sense? Um, how could you get to, uh, to a good bottom line of, of profitability to do something in space? Um, and, and with us, it's finally the first commercial opportunity to really do that. So we're excited for, for that, that first um, uh, kind of spark uh, that would start the uh, commercial Leo economy. We see, you know, definitely there's there's promise here and there, and 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 folks kind of just, uh, you know, getting to a point where um, it's it's making sense for them, um, and we just want to apply that platform for uh, to to make that opportunity a reality. Is there anything that perhaps I haven't asked? That maybe Vast wants to be able to get out there to people. Um, so most of our outreach um, on the uh, with Haven One is to market the seats on a, an individual basis. So that's could be private individuals, um, but also sovereign individuals uh, too. As it is scheduled, will be the world's first um, commercial space station. Um, so a lot of the opportunities that a little bit restricted on ISS um, can now come to bear um, in a pressurized cargo environment. So in space manufacturing, uh, potentially brand partnerships um, could be realized uh, truly on a space station of our ownership and control. That said too, uh, we're also very interested in, in outreach to uh, other sovereign entities, international space agencies to join us on those missions. Uh, so we've had contact with, with a lot of the leading ones around the world. I hope to engage um, nearly all of them uh, in a couple months time and really communicate them and educate them what, what is actually going to exist in a very short amount of time um, and what opportunity could exist for, for crew members, uh, for, for pressurized cargo opportunities um, in space in, in just under two years. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Welcome back. If you're 23 years old or younger, and okay, that discounts quite a few of us, so if you aren't in that club, remember being 23 or younger? <laughs> if, if that's you today, then guess what? You've never been alive when people weren't living in space. Because it's been 23 years today since the first crew docked with the International Space Station, and it has been continuously occupied ever since. And I know we have many listeners on the younger side who may indeed be 23 or younger, like you. And I know many of us may be, generously, a smidge older than that. So if your 40th birthday is coming up, my condolences, and if it happens to be on February 7th, 2024, then depending on when you were born that day, there's a decent chance as you were coming into this world, there was someone floating free and untethered in orbit high above you for the very first time in human history. That's because on February 7th, 1984, during the STS-41B mission, astronaut Bruce McCandless II was the first human to ever spacewalk without any kind of tether to a spacecraft. On that day, he and his colleague Robert L. Stewart 
both performed untethered spacewalks with the Manned Maneuvering Unit, or MMU. Yeah, those epic photos of astronauts free-floating above our beautiful planet, I'm sure you know the ones, they're very hard to forget. McCandless and Stewart logged nearly six hours of MMU time in its very first use. So, if we conveniently ignore time zone differences, and if you accept a baseline assumption here that babies are born at a steady rate throughout the day, some napkin math for the sake of fun here after all, for all our February 7, 1984 babies listening, you've got a 25% chance of being born in the window when there was a human free-floating in space for the first time in history. But that's the past. What about now? Well, yesterday, November 1st, aboard, or really I should say outside the ISS, there was a noteworthy occasion. The fourth ever all-female extravehicular activity, or EVA, occurred, aka a spacewalk, with astronauts Jasmine Mobelli and Laurel O'Hara completing a six-hour, 42-minute EVA to perform much-needed systems maintenance. And if you think an all-female EVA isn't noteworthy, please compare and contrast with the total number of all-male EVAs, which I'd bet decent money most of us couldn't name offhand. Versus four. I'm looking forward to this not being a noteworthy thing, one EVA at a time. That's it for T-Minus for November 2nd, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth, Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karpf. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.